Chapter 10 A London Cab Horse Jerry Barker was a small man, but well-made and quick in all his movements. He lived in London and was a cab driver. Jerry's wife, Polly, was a little woman with smooth, dark hair and dark eyes. His son, Harry, was nearly twelve years old and was a tall, good-tempered boy. His daughter, Dolly, was eight, and she looked just like her mother. Jerry had his own cab and two horses, which he drove and groomed himself. His other horse was a tall, white animal called Captain. The next morning, Polly and Dolly came to see me. Harry had helped his father since early that morning and had already decided that I would be a good horse. Polly brought me a piece of apple and Dolly brought me some bread. We'll call him Jack, after the old one, said Jerry. Shall we, Polly? Yes, she said. I like to keep a good name going. Captain went out in the cab all morning, and I went out in the afternoon. Jerry took a lot of care to make sure that my collar and bridle were comfortable, and there was no bearing rein. We went to the cab stand, where the other cabs were waiting for passengers and took our place at the back of the last cab. Several of the other drivers came to look at me. Too handsome, said one. You'll find something wrong with him one morning. Then a man in a grey coat and grey hat came up. His name was Grant, and he looked a happy, sensible kind of man. He had been longer on the cab stand than any of the other men, so they let him through to have a look at me and waited for his opinion. He looked me all over very carefully, then said, He's the right kind for you, Jerry. I don't care what you paid for him. He'll be worth it. My first week as a cab horse was very hard. I was not used to London. The noise, the hurry, the crowds of horses, carts and carriages. But Jerry was a good driver, and soon discovered that I was willing to work and do my best. He never used the whip on me and we soon understood each other as well as a horse and man can do. Jerry kept his horses clean, and gave us plenty of food and fresh water, and on Sundays we rested. I never knew a better man than my new master. He was kind and good-tempered, like John Manley. Harry was clever at stable work and always wanted to do what he could. Polly and Dolly came in the morning to brush out the cab and to wash the glass, while Jerry gave Captain and me a grooming. There was a lot of laughing and fun between them, which all helped to keep Captain and me happy. The family came early in the morning, because Jerry did not like lateness. It always made him angry when people wanted him to drive hard because of their own lateness. One day, two wild-looking young men called to him. Cabby, hurry up! We are late for our train at Victoria! 
Get us there in time for the one o'clock train, and we'll pay you double. I will take you at the usual speed, gentlemen, said Jerry. Extra money doesn't pay for extra speed. Larry's cab was standing next to ours. He opened the door and said, I'm your man, gentlemen. My horse will get you there all right. And as he shut them in, with a smile at Jerry, he said, He always refuses to go faster than a trot. Then, whipping his horse hard, he went off as fast as he could. Jerry patted me on the neck. Extra money won't pay for that kind of thing, will it, Jack? He said. Although he was against hard driving to please careless people, he always went at a fair speed and was not against going faster if there was a good reason. I remember one morning we were on the stand waiting for a passenger when a young man carrying a large suitcase went by. He stepped on a piece of apple which lay in the road and fell down heavily. Jerry ran across the road and helped him up, then took him into a shop to sit him down. Some time later, the young man, looking white and ill, came out again and called Jerry. So we went across the road. Can you take me to the South Eastern Railway? he said. My fall has made me late and it's very important that I don't miss the twelve o'clock train. I'll pay you extra if you can get me there in time. We'll do our best, sir, said Jerry, and helped him into the cab. It was always difficult to drive fast in the city in the middle of the day, when the streets were full of traffic. But Jerry and I were used to it, and no one was faster at getting through the carriages and carts, all moving at different speeds, going this way and that way. In and out, in and out we went as fast as a horse can do it. And we got to the station just as the big clock showed eight minutes to twelve. We're in time, said the young man happily. Thank you, my friend, and your good horse too. Take this extra money. No, sir, said Jerry. Thank you, but it isn't necessary. I'm glad we were in time. Now hurry and catch your train. When we got back to the cab stand, the other men were laughing because Jerry had driven hard to the train. How much extra did he pay you, Jerry? said one driver. Nothing, said Jerry. He offered me extra, but I didn't take it. If Jack and I choose to have a quick run now and then, that's our business, and not yours. You'll never be a rich man then, said Larry. Perhaps not, said Jerry, but I'll be a happy one. And you, Larry, added Mr Grant, will die poor, because you spend too much money on new whips, beating your poor horse until it's exhausted, and then you have to buy another one. Well, I've never had good luck with my horses, said Larry. And you never will, said Mr Grant. Good luck is very careful who she travels with, 
and mostly chooses those who are kind and sensible. That's my experience anyway. He turned round again to his newspaper, and the other men went back to their cabs. Winter came early, with snow, rain, or strong winds almost every day for weeks. Jerry sometimes went to a coffee shop near the cab stand, and sometimes Dolly came with some hot soup that Polly had made for him. One cold, windy day, Dolly was waiting for Jerry to finish his soup when a gentleman came towards us. Jerry started to give the soup bowl back to Dolly and was just going to take off my warm cloth when the man said, No, no, finish your soup, my friend. I can wait in the cab until you've finished. Jerry thanked him, then came back to Dolly. That's a real gentleman, Dolly, he said. He has time and thought for the comfort of a poor cab driver. Jerry finished his soup. Then we took the man to Clapham. After that, he took our cab several times, and often came to pat me. It was very unusual for anyone to notice a cab horse, and I was grateful. Another day, the gentleman saw a cart with two horses standing in the street. The driver was not with them, and I don't know how long they had been standing there. However, they decided to move on a few steps. Suddenly, the cart driver ran out of a building and caught them. He seemed very angry and began to whip the horses hard, even beating them around the head. Our gentleman saw him and walked quickly across. Stop that at once, or I'll call the police, he said. The driver was drunk, and he began to shout, but he stopped whipping the horses. Meanwhile, our gentleman wrote down the name and address that was on the side of the cart. Why do you want that? shouted the driver. Our gentleman didn't answer. He came back to the cab. Many people have thanked me for telling them how their horses have been used, he told Jerry. I wish there were more gentlemen like you, sir, said Jerry. They are needed in this city. Chapter 11 Goodbye to Old Friends One day, we were waiting outside one of the London parks when a dirty old cab drove up beside ours. The horse was brown, with bones that showed through her coat. I was eating some hay, and the wind took a little of it her way. The poor animal put out her long, thin neck and picked it up, then turned and looked for more. There was a hopeless look in her dull eye, and I wondered where I'd seen her before. Then she looked straight at me. Black Beauty? Is that you? she said. It was Ginger. But how different she looked. Her face, which was once so full of life, was now miserable and full of pain, and her breathing was very bad. I moved closer to her, so that we could have a quiet talk. 
and it was a sad story that she told me. After twelve months' rest at Earl's Hall, she was considered to be ready to work again, and was sold to a gentleman. She got on well for a little while, but after a long gallop one day, she became ill again. She was rested, was seen by a horse doctor, then sold. In this way, she went from owner to owner several times, each one poorer than the one before. So, at last, I was bought by a man who keeps a number of cabs and horses and hires them out, said Ginger. You look happy and comfortable with life as a cab horse, and I'm glad. But it's different for me. They whip me and work me seven days a week. They say that they paid more for me than I was worth, and now they're trying to get their money back by working me until I drop. You used to stand up and fight when people were cruel to you, I said. Yes, I did once, said Ginger. But men are stronger than we are. And if they're cruel and have no feelings, then there's nothing we can do about it. Oh, I wish the end would come. I wish I was dead. I was very sad. I put my nose against hers, but could find nothing to say that would cheer her up. I think she was pleased to see me, because she said, You're the only friend I ever had. A few weeks after this, a cart with a dead horse in it passed by our cab stand. It was a brown horse with a long, thin neck, and I believe it was Ginger. I hoped it was, because then her troubles would be over. There was one day when we were very busy. First, a fat gentleman with a large bag wanted to go to Bishopsgate Station. Then we were called by a lady who wanted to be taken to Regent's Park. Then a man jumped into the cab and called out, Bow Street Police Station, quick! After another journey or two, we came back to the cab stand and Jerry gave me some food, saying, We must eat when we can on days like this, Jack. And he took out the meat and bread Polly had given him. But neither of us had eaten many mouthfuls before a poor young woman came along the street. She was carrying a child, and she looked lost and worried. Can you tell me the way to St. Thomas's Hospital, please? she asked. I have to take my little boy there, and I'm a stranger in London. The little boy was crying as she spoke. He's in great pain and can't walk, but the doctor says that if I can get him to the hospital, then perhaps he'll get well again. You can't carry him through the crowd, said Jerry. It's five kilometres, and that child is heavy. I'm strong, said the woman. I think I can manage, if I know the way. You can't do it. Just get into this cab, and I'll drive you there. Don't you see? that it's beginning to rain? No, sir, I can't do that, she said. 
I've only just enough money to get me home again. Listen, said Jerry. I've got a wife and children at home, and I'd be ashamed of myself if I let a woman and a sick child put themselves in danger. Get in the cab, and I'll take you for nothing. Oh, how kind you are, said the woman, and began to cry. Jerry opened the door, but two men ran up, calling out, Cab! It's taken, said Jerry. But one man pushed past the woman and jumped in, followed by the other. This cab is already taken, gentlemen, Jerry said again, by this lady. Lady! said one of the men unpleasantly, looking at the woman's poor clothes. She can wait. Our business is very important. And anyway, we were in first and we'll stay in. A smile came over Jerry's face as he shut the cab door. Stay in as long as you like, gentlemen. I can wait while you rest yourselves. He walked over to the young woman who was standing nearby. <laughs> They'll soon be gone. Don't worry, he said, laughing. And he was right. When the two men realised that they were going to have a very long wait, they got out, calling Jerry all kinds of bad names. After this, we were soon on our way to the hospital. Thank you a thousand times, said the young woman, as Jerry helped her out of the cab. I hope your child will soon be better, said Jerry. He watched her go in, then patted my neck. It was something he always did when he was pleased. The rain was now coming down fast, and just as we were leaving the hospital, a lady came down the steps calling, Cab! Jerry seemed to know her at once. Jerry Barker, is it you? said the woman. I'm very glad to find you here. It's difficult to get a cab in this part of London today. I'll be proud to take you, said Jerry. Where do you want to go? Paddington Station, said the woman. We got to the station and went in under cover. The lady stood beside the cab talking to Jerry for some time. And I discovered that she was once Polly's mistress. How do you like cab work in the winter? she asked Jerry. Polly was worried about your cough last year. She worries because I work all hours and in all kinds of weather, said Jerry. But I get on all right, and I would be lost without horses to look after. It would be wrong to harm your health in this work when you have a wife and two children, said the lady. There are many places where good drivers or grooms are wanted. If you ever decide to give up cab work, let me know. She put something into his hand. There's some money for the children. Jerry thanked her. And after leaving the station, we went home. Christmas and the New Year are no holidays for cab drivers and their horses. People go to parties and dances, and the work is often late. Sometimes 
Driver and horse have to wait for hours, shaking with cold. We had a lot of late work during Christmas week, and Jerry's cough was bad. On New Year's Eve, we took two gentlemen to a house in the West End, and were told to come for them at eleven o'clock. You may have to wait a few minutes, but don't be late," one of them said. Jerry arrived at the right time, and we waited. The wind was very cold, and it was snowing. Jerry pulled one of my cloths higher over my neck, then walked up and down, trying to keep warm. At half past twelve, Jerry rang the doorbell, and asked if the gentleman still wanted the cab. The man at the door said, "Oh yes, you'll be wanted." At one o'clock, the door opened. And two men came out. They got in the cab without a word, and told Jerry where to drive. It was three kilometres away. And when the men got out, they didn't say they were sorry for the long wait, but they were angry when Jerry made them pay for the extra waiting time. But it was money hard earned. When we got home, Jerry could not speak, and his cough was terrible. But he groomed me, and made sure that I was warm and comfortable. It was late the next morning before anyone came, and then it was only Harry. He cleaned us, and gave us our food, but was very quiet. Later that morning he came again, and this time Dolly came with him. She was crying, and I discovered from their conversation that Jerry was dangerously ill. Two days passed, and only Harry and Dolly came to the stable. On the third day, Mr. Grant from the cab stand arrived when Harry was in the stable. I won't go to the house, boy. But how is your father? He said. He's very bad," said Harry. "I'm sorry to hear that," said Mr. Grant. "He's the best man I know." But when he came the next day, Harry was able to tell him, "Father is better today." Mother hopes he will get over it soon. Thank God," said Mr. Grant. He was a kind man, and did a lot to help the family during this time, because while Jerry was ill, he was earning no money, and we all had to eat. Jerry got slowly better. But the doctor said he must never do cab work again. The children talked a lot about what their mother and father would do. But a few days later, Dolly ran into the stable to find Harry. There's a letter from Mrs. Fowler, mother's old mistress," said Dolly. "She wants father to be her carriage driver." And we're going to live in a cottage in the country, with chickens and apple trees and everything. This was bad news for me. I was not young now, and could not hope for a better master than Jerry, although Mr. Grant promised to find a comfortable place for me. I never saw Jerry again, and was very sorry to leave. <laughs> Chapter Twelve: Hard Times. I was sold to a baker 
who Jerry knew. But the baker's cart driver was a man called Jakes, who drove with the bearing rein up. This made it difficult for me to pull a heavy cart, and I found the work very hard. One day, after three or four months of this, I was pulling the cart, which was much heavier than usual, up a steep hill. I had to stop several times to rest, which didn't please Jake's. Move on, you lazy horse, or I'll make you, he shouted, and he hit me with his whip. After a few more meters, I had to stop again. The whip came down across my back once more, and the pain was sharp. I was doing my best, but the driver was still punishing me cruelly, which seemed very unfair. Jakes was whipping me a third time, when a woman hurried over and said, Oh, please, don't whip your horse like that. I think I can help, if you'll let me. Jakes laughed. <laughs> oh? He can't use all his strength when his head is held back with that bearing rein, the woman went on. If you take it off, I'm sure he'll do better. Anything to please a lady, said Jake, smiling. The rein was taken off, and I moved my head up and down several times to help my aching neck. Poor boy! Is that what you wanted? said the woman, patting me. She turned to Jake's. If you speak to him kindly and lead him on, I believe he'll do better. Jake's took the rein, and I put down my head and moved on. I pulled the cart up the hill, then stopped to take a breath. Well, that helped, said Jakes. But if I went without a bearing rein all the time, the other cart drivers would laugh at me. It's fashionable, you see. It's better to start a good fashion than to follow a bad one, said the woman. Many gentlemen don't use bearing reins now. She gave me another pat on the neck and walked on. After that, Jake's always took off my bearing rein when I was going up a hill, and that made my life easier. But pulling heavy carts day after day slowly began to exhaust me, and a younger horse was brought in to do my work. I was sold to another cab owner, whose name was Nicholas Skinner. He was hard on his drivers, and they were hard on the horses. We worked long hours, had no Sunday rest, and it was a hot summer. My driver was just as hard as his master, and he had a cruel whip with something sharp at the end, which often cut me and made me bleed. It was a terrible life, and sometimes, like poor Ginger, I wished I was dead. One day I nearly got my wish. We were at the railway station, when a family of four people hired us. There was a noisy man with a lady, a little boy, a young girl, and a lot of heavy luggage. Father, said the young girl, this poor horse can't take us and all our luggage. He's too tired. Oh, he's all right, miss, said my driver. 
he put a heavy box on the cab with the other luggage. Father, please take a second cab, said the girl. I'm sure this is very cruel. Grace, get in at once and don't be stupid, said her father. The driver knows his own business. My gentle friend had to obey, and box after box was lifted up and put on the top of the cab or next to the driver. Then the driver hit me with his whip, and we moved out of the station. The cab was very heavy, and I had not eaten or rested since early that morning. I did my best, and got along quite well until we came to Ludgate Hill. By then I was exhausted, and the heavy cab was too much for me. My feet went from under me, and I fell heavily, knocking all the breath out of me. I lay quite still because I could not move. Indeed, I expected to die. There were angry voices above me, and luggage was taken off the cab, but it was all like a dream. I thought I heard the girl's voice saying, Oh, that poor horse, it's all our fault. Someone loosened my bridle and collar, and another voice said, He's dead. He'll never get up again. I heard a policeman giving orders, but I did not open my eyes. Cold water was thrown over my head, some medicine was put into my mouth, and I was covered with a cloth. I don't know how long I was there, but a man with a kind voice persuaded me to try to get up, and I managed it. Then I was gently led to some stables close by. That evening I was taken back to Skinner's stables, and the next morning the horse doctor came to see me. He's been worked too hard, said the doctor. There's no strength left in him. Then he must go for dog food, said Skinner. I have no fields for sick horses. It doesn't suit my business. I work them for as long as they'll go. Then I sell them for what I can get. There's a horse fair in ten days' time, said the doctor. If you rest him and give him food, he may get better, and then you may get more than his skin's worth. Luckily for me, Skinner took the doctor's advice, and after rest and food, I began to feel better. Ten days later, I was taken to the horse fair, a few miles outside London. <laughs> Chapter 13 my last home. I was sold to a farmer at the horse fair, but it was his young grandson who persuaded him to buy me. The two of them walked past me, and seeing kindness in the farmer's face, I lifted my head, put my ears forward, and tried to look my best. The farmer stopped and looked at me. There's a horse, Willie, that has known better days, he said. Poor thing, said the boy. Do you think he was ever a carriage horse, Grandfather? Oh, yes, said the farmer. Look at his fine head and the shape of his neck and shoulder. He reached out a hand and patted me on the neck. I put out my nose in answer to his kindness, 
and the boy gently put his hand against my face. Look how well he understands kindness, said the boy. Won't you buy him and make him young and strong again? The man who was selling me said, The boy can recognize a good horse, sir. This one isn't old, just tired and thin from too much work. In six months he'll be fine. Five pounds changed hands, and soon after I was taken to my new home. The farmer gave orders for me to have hay and oats every night and morning, and I was let out into a large field in the daytime. Willie, the young boy, was responsible for me, and he came to see me every day bringing carrots or apples. During that winter, the rest, the good food, the soft grass and gentle running and trotting all helped to make me feel quite young again. When the spring came, the farmer tried me with a carriage, and I did the work quite easily. He's growing young, Willie he said. We'll give him some gentle work and look for a good home for him. One day during this summer, the groom cleaned and dressed me with special care, and Willie seemed half worried and half excited as he got into the carriage with his grandfather. I hope the ladies like him said the farmer. A kilometre or two beyond the village, we came to a pretty house, and Willie went to knock on the door. He asked if Miss Bloomfield and Miss Ellen were at home. They were, and Willie stayed with me while the farmer went into the house. He came back about ten minutes later with three ladies. They seemed to like me, but one of them, worried by my knees, wondered if I was safe. It's true his knees were broken once, said the farmer, but we don't know why he fell. It was probably a careless driver, and not the horse's fault at all. He seems very safe to me. If you like him, you can try him for a few weeks, he went on. Then your driver will see what he thinks of him. One of the three ladies, a tall, white-faced lady, who held the arm of a younger woman, said, You have always given us good advice about our horses, so we accept your offer to try him. The next morning, a young man came for me. He looked pleased until he saw my knees. Then he said, I'm surprised you suggested this horse to my ladies. You're only taking him to try him, said the farmer. If he's not as safe as any horse you ever drove, send him back, young man. I was taken to a comfortable stable, given some food, then left to myself. The next day, the groom was cleaning my face when he said, That's just like the star that Black Beauty had on his forehead. I wonder where he is now. He looked more closely at me. White star on the forehead? One white foot, and a little white place on his back? It must be Black Beauty. Beauty, do you know me? I'm little Joe Green, who almost killed you. 
and he began patting me all over my back. I could not say I remembered him, as he was now a fine young man, with a black moustache and a deep voice. But I was sure he knew me, and that he was Joe Green, and I was very glad. I put my nose up to him, and tried to say that we were friends. I never saw a man so pleased. That afternoon, I was harnessed to a carriage for Miss Ellen to try me. Joe Green went with her, and told her that he was sure I was Mr. Gordon's old black beauty. I shall write to Mrs. Gordon, and tell her that her favourite horse has come to us, said Miss Ellen. How pleased she will be! I have now lived in this happy place a whole year. Joe is the best and kindest of grooms. My work is easy and pleasant, and I feel my strength coming back again. The ladies have promised that they will never sell me, and so I have nothing to fear. And here my story ends. My troubles are all over, and I am at home. And often, before I am quite awake, I dream I am still in the field at Birtwick, standing with my old friends under the apple trees.